This week was kind of a <clears throat> transition week in that we have just finished uh, our study in James and uh, as always, talking with folks kind of uh, helps me out. I've been thinking about some things and just wondering when was the right time? When's the right time? And uh, this week as I hope to answer a question that one has asked, and I know there's on the heart of many people, uh, and that is, what do you expect out of me? What do you expect out of me as a member of this church? Well, the only expectations I can have as a short answer is the expectations that the Lord has for you. I put no extra burdens on you, uh, only as the Lord leads in your life and only as the Lord expects but we're going to explore that, and the reason was the things that go on in our church. Uh, I had some folks tell me that, you know, for a little church, we've bitten off quite a bit of stuff. And I said to that person, well, we haven't. God opened a door, and we're going to go in it, and he's promised to bless us. And it, it made me think back years Oh, a year and a half ago before I ever became pastor of this church. Uh, we were in a process with our pastor search committee. They were head over heels and resumes and doing all their due diligence, praying and looking for that person. And a, and a familiar statement began to be made. Uh, we were talking about we need to do certain things, but yet the expectation was that we needed to wait until the pastor came because we don't know what the pastor wants to do we don't know the pastor's vision we don't know the things that he likes to do and, and there's good reason for that because there are many pastors that have a briefcase full of their favorite programs that have always worked for a little while somewhere and they seem to carry it from church to church but as i was thinking over 43 years uh, of being in the ministry, I've watched little churches stay little, and I've watched dying churches die because they never got traction. It was always, it seems like in the life of a church, every two to three years, the Lord will either lead a pastor away or lead the church to ask the pastor to go away. W whatever happens, there seems to be that that period of time that there is a pastoral rollover. So a church will begin, the church will plateau, the church will sink, and then the new one comes in and we have new stuff. And so how in the world can you ever expect to get traction? In those years, I was blessed to be a part of two large churches. And I watched the right way to do something, and I watched the wrong way to do something. I watched a church that was all about special events, one special occasion after another, and I watched that church wither on the vine and die from a lack of interest because you can only have so many special events before they're not special anymore. I watched a church that used the New Testament the example of the early church, I watched that church and was blessed to be a part of that church over a 30-year period of time, move from about 250 people to 7,500 people. Now, I don't say that as looking like, wow, when are we going to get 75? But here's what I saw. As that church began to invest in ministry, investing in obedience to the Great Commission. I watched a church that was hemmed all the way around, all of a sudden found, finding themselves in the middle of about five, about uh, two complete city blocks, two, three complete city blocks, where people, as they died or moved, gave their property to the church, and a ministry was built. It started slow. It started as a halfway house for homeless people. And pretty soon on that campus, from before birth to the grave, they have ministry. 
for every type of person. They've now even invested into two motels that they use as transition stations for families that lose their house or for some reason lose a job, they can move them in. They have a period of time that they help them get on their feet. But it was the New Testament, chapter 2, verse 42 through about verse 47 of the book of Acts, that's keyed on. It talked about the early believers begin to go house to house and door to door. It said the new believers were firm in their prayer. They were in the apostles' doctrine, which was the word of God. They began to share all that they had. And people began to bring their excess in in order to meet the needs. And that church in Jerusalem basically grew into what became the first megachurch. It didn't stay a megachurch long because the great commission that Jesus had given them said, go into the world. They were to begin in Jerusalem, but they were to go to the other most parts of the earth. And so the Lord brought about some persecution within Jerusalem, and those thousands began to scatter. Most went back to where they lived in the beginning, but they took the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. The apostles, the early deacons, the early leaders of that church, as they scattered, it came to the point where it was said that the gospel had spread all the way around the world and it had upset the world. It had changed the world. It had impacted the world. Why? Because of obedience by ordinary people following the commands of God, believing God to be all-sufficient for every need. That church, we are a part of that early church. Because of the strength of that early church, we exist today. So I begin to think about community church. And as we came here, I said to you all that I believe we need to be truly New Testament. Uh, The worship services, as we gather each week, I look forward to them. Uh, We sing together. There's, uh, I've always marveled at people here love each other, and it's almost like we have to have a bell to go off and say, hey, it's time to come in and sing, because you're enjoying each other's company. That's great to see. That's That's a wonderful thing. That's the encouragement of the body of Christ coming together. Somebody walks in down, someone's gonna hug them. This this morning I had someone come to me and say, Pastor, we need to be praying for so and so. They're not feeling good. The inner love and care that the body of Christ was created to give gives us the energy, the strength, and the hope to face Monday morning. That's why we gather. But during the week, The church was birthed for the streets. In fact, when you read the uh, book of Acts, the church was actually birthed in the streets as Peter began to preach openly in Jerusalem and thousands came to Christ. What is community doing? Well, we reach out in our community through Summer Splash. We made a new adventure this year. We went into Bunnell. I think we laid some groundwork. Good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. We'll be back there next year, a little wiser and smarter in our approach, but we're going back into Bunnell. This year, this next week, will be our third week in Seminole Woods. God has given us some great people, people who came to know Christ, people who were baptized, people who were encouraged. We're back there again. Not only that, we do after-school clubs. Old Kings Elementary has been one of our after-school clubs for a long time. But we're adding a new one. We're going into Bunnell Elementary. We'll not be in the elementary school. We work with the city, and they're, I, I want to say I'm thankful for our city because they're always ready to work with us. We're going to use Old City Hall on Tuesday. We're going to bus kids from Bunnell Elementary to that city hall, and we're going to start an after-school program in Bunnell. 
a new opportunity that we're putting together is backpacks. Last count, there are 82 children who literally live on the streets. They get their breakfast and their lunch when they come to school, but when they go home on the weekend, they don't have anything to eat or any assurance that they will be eating. And so I found a program where I'm going to ask y'all to buy a backpack enough for these kids. And we're going to buy the supplies. We're going to meet on Thursday in the fellowship hall. And we're going to pack up food that can be eaten if someone doesn't have a home. And we'll take those backpacks to school on, on Friday morning. The teachers will disperse those through the weekends. We'll get them back on Monday. Because you know the Lord told us we need to feed those that are hungry, not just give a blessing. We partnered with Tomoka Church. We have the last two years in two locations for those uh, lifeline food packing. And I think between the two times, last year and this year, we packed out over 100,000 meals that went to feed hungry families. That was a balanced meal that had nutrients and had vitamins. Our Wednesday night, we're wrapping it up. It used to be known as Awana. But I think branding is very important. And talking with Melissa, we simply have treehouse ministries. When we say treehouse, that means children. Grown people, when they climb trees, fall out of trees and hurt themselves. Children can climb in trees. So it's a treehouse ministry. Nine o'clock on Sunday morning, we have Bible study. Wednesday nights, we have treehouse ministry where children learn the Bible verse. Not only learn it, they learn where it where it's found in the Bible, how to use their Bible, how to share their faith, what it means to live a Christian life. All of that goes on in Treehouse Alley on Wednesday evening. On Sunday morning, our kids are back in Treehouse Alley where they have their worship service led by some young ladies who will soon uh, be our second generation praise team. You're going to see four young ladies that are going to be on this stage from time to time. They're learning to lead worship. Their heart is there. Their gifts are there. And so we're going to train up that next generation that's out of our treehouse alley. On Tuesday, some ladies gather here, and they play all kind of card games and dominoes and mahjong and uh, all kind of games, and they gather in that room, and it's been a, a great time. Every week I get to meet new people that have come in on game days. There's a table out there for community crafters. They come in on Wednesday, and they learn how to do decorations and make quilts and just make all kind of stuff, and they have a great time. Our social hall is full of these people. These are outreach opportunities in order to share the message of Jesus Christ and his love. You see, these are not events that we put on. They're ongoing ministries because there are a lot of people that you will invite to come Sunday morning, and they won't come Sunday morning because they're afraid of what might happen if they come in this congregation but they'll play games they'll go to the park with us they'll make crafts with us but in those groups is a lived out message of the love of Jesus and acceptance and if there's one thing in this world that there's not a lot of that's human contact love and acceptance most communications are text me and email me and there's no feeling there's no touching you have some what do you call those emoles or things that you stick on there that smiley face and that stuff i tried that one time put the wrong emole on there and so i just give up on that these are things for community baptist church touches our community but guys you go beyond the community christ hope international last year we opened a shelter in Mwanda, Tanzania, we feed, clothe, and educate and minister to AIDS-affected orphans and children who are vulnerable to AIDS. We educate them. These kids now have graduated. They're first in that area of these child care centers. They've graduated their first group from high school. Now they're into college. That's a $5,000 a year sponsorship. 
as well as some 30 of you sponsor an individual child every month, making sure that they have that food, the clothing. And the thing about this, this is not an orphanage. They get to go home to what family is left. We don't tear down the family. We have a partnership in church planting among the Sudanese refugees. 450 churches have been planted. Thousands have come to Christ. There's a huge Muslim movement of Christianity in the underground. That's the $5,000 a year sponsorship that we sponsor with. We're going to reestablish church planting partnership in, in uh, Lithuania. The planting of churches and the spreading of the gospel. We go to Jerusalem, which is our Benel, and Flagler County, to the uttermost parts of the earth. These ministries depend on two things, volunteers and money. Okay, You knew it was coming. But I want to announce to you that our church, we practice biblical tithing, but we practice it beyond the tithe. Fourteen percent of every dollar that we receive that's not guided to a specific part is tithe. That's how we pay for these partnerships. That's how we pay for the food that we feed. It's how we pay for the things that we do with the volunteers that step up and say, I'll go, and with your faithful, consistent giving. You see, new opportunities in our community and across the world, they come out every week. And when we are faithful in our giving and consistent in our giving, and I have to say consistency, because here's the thing, guys. There's times that air conditions tore up, and uh, there's times that things have happened uh, that we don't plan for, budget for. That comes from the overflow. Our church is heavily invested in ministry. We don't have a building payment. We, we don't have to pay for land. God has provided for it. But it's consistent, faithful giving. And knowing how, I want you to know how much I love you guys. And so we came up with a way that when you're on vacation, you can still give. Isn't that great of me? Have you seen that commercial of a guy gets on a plane and the lady's coming down the hall and his wife texts him and said, you put the check in the bank? And then all of a sudden the lady's walking to say, turn off your phone. He whips out the check. He gets out his phone. He takes the picture. Whew, he can enjoy his flight. We have online giving. You can text. You can email. Your checking account or debit card. Why am I saying this? You know, most preachers will commit suicide because a lot of times people don't like to hear that it takes money to give, to run a church. It takes money to do ministry. We don't get things that are given to us. But I want to tell you something. Every time we are faithful and take a step, not turn down a step, but take a step and take on a ministry, God has said that when we're faithful, he will be faithful. You say, preacher, why did you say all of this? Well, for two reasons. You need to know where your money goes when you give. You need to know when we say it's important that you give faithfully, why it's important. And secondly, you need to know where you're needed. You need to know your opportunities. Remember the question I told you about at the beginning of the message? Pastor, what do you expect from me? I only have so much time. I've got a job. I've got a family. I've got bills. I can't do everything. And it was a great question. But see, the answer to that is no one is expected to do everything. If you look in the Bible, Christ's message came down to three words, pray, give, and go, those three words. And as I thought about them, everyone can pray faithfully and consistently. Everyone can give faithfully and consistently. 
Where you minister is according to your heart, your spiritual gifts, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We have different, what I call, crews of people that show up when God leads them with that thing that tugs on their heart. We have people that work with children because that's where their heart is. They know that if we're going to change a generation, we have to start when they're children. Train that child in that way that he should go. Train them in the way that they're bent. When they're old, they'll not depart from it. So everybody is not expected to do everything. But everything that we do must be, needs to be bathed in prayer. Because every year when we go in the community, we find at least one that is there waiting to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's a child, sometimes it's the parent of a child that is struggling in life. Everybody needs to pray consistently on their face that God would fulfill what he did in the book of Acts. And that was add to the church daily those that were being saved. And then you follow your spiritual gifts. You follow where the Lord leads you. And our ministry will be covered. I long for the time that I can be a Moses and step on this stage and say, people, stop giving. We've got more than we need. Now you laugh, but it happened twice in the Bible. Happened two times. Said to the people, stop. Well, I'm saying, put the pedal to the metal. We're not at the stopping time. Now, what's that got all to do with this? You see, it's not my role as a pastor to get up and convince you to volunteer to do ministry. It's not my role as a pastor to try to convince you to give faithfully. That's not my role as a pastor. My role as a pastor is to be a shepherd. And according to the Word of God, there are certain things that ensure a full life. And the shepherd's role is to guide sheep. And my role as a pastor is guide our people in growing in discipleship. Discipleship is not just Bible study. That's the only part of it. Discipleship is learning the Word of God, being filled with that Word, the encouragement of that Word, the power of that Word. And then, just as the disciples sat at Jesus' feet everywhere that he went, they watched him do the miracles, they watched him touch people, live with people, love people. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, it's time for you now to take the baton and go into the world. That baton has been passed down from the disciples, the apostles, down to us. We are the ones that God has entrusted the saving message of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? He doesn't write it in letters in the sky so much, but he says live it out in your lives every day. Because they are fellow strugglers. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Peter said, You're being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you realize that every person here is a priest before God? Now, I don't know what your view as a priest is. That goes from uh, life experience to life experience. But the Old Testament priest had to be clean, cer ceremonially clean, and put on clean garments before they could take the sacrifice. They had to bring the sacrifice, a blood offering for their sins before God. And then they would bring the sacrifices through blood for the sins of the people. 
The priests ministered before God for the people because at that time people could not go into the presence of God. But now every person, it's called the priesthood of the believer. It's good that you call me or someone else to pray for you. But God has said to you, you are a priest before me. Come before me seeking the forgiveness of your sins. Come before me praying that others would know Christ. You have the right to go in the presence of God anytime, any place, and for any reason. We are priests before God and we're priests before people. This morning, I'm going to let the wisest man in the world speak to us. I'm just going to read what he says, okay? There was a guy who experienced life like no other person ever experienced it. He had, in fact, I've been told by people who do that kind of counting that they would have to put, you know, they've got millions, billions, and trillions. They'd have to go another level to measure the wealth of Solomon. Not only did he have wealth, he was the wisest man that ever walked. Not only in the wisdom and knowledge and leading to life, y'all remember the story, two women were arguing about one baby, and Solomon said, I'll tell you what, bring me a sword, and we'll cut the baby in half and give half to each of you. The woman whose baby it wasn't said, that's fair, do that. The woman who really had that child said, no, spares life, give him to the other one. And Solomon then knew who the mother of that child was. Not only that, he was an architectural genius, but he had his nicks and his armor. Solomon, in writing the book of Ecclesiastes, said, life is a vapor. You know, we're told today, grab a hold of life, live it to the fullest. Solomon found out that life is a vapor. You don't ever really grab a hold of life. Life is going to grab a hold of you. Solomon described his life, his journey, his pursuit to experience, in his words, every pleasure. He called that grasping at the wind. You cannot grab hold of the wind. It's fruitless. And in fact, in this book, he said, The end of all the matter has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, and every secret thing, whether be good or evil. So how do I challenge you as your pastor? Not to do stuff or things, but to walk obediently before the Lord. You see, the Bible tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to God is what keys the heart of God. In fact, when you read Scripture, God will bring every force within His power on the side of that person who determines in their heart they're going to walk faithfully before God in everything. They're going to trust God with everything because in reality, we still haven't got it through our heads. We don't own anything. We don't have anything. Everything that we have has been granted and given as a gift for God. In fact, God calls us His stewards. This is His earth. This is His world. This is the things that are in it. These are the things that God has given each of us. And He has said to us, be good stewards. Multiply. So, Pastor, I've got a job, I've got bills, I've got children, 
I can't do everything. Neither can I. I hope you find these words comforting. Proverbs chapter 3. Solomon says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. You see, that's the key to everything in life. He's going to talk about the things that we care about. Long, healthy life. Did you know the health, just the supplement business? You know, the stuff you put on your head and the wrinkles disappear and they turn an ugly 60-year-old woman into a beautiful 20-year-old girl? You've seen it on television. They got them there. You know, I haven't found them in real life, but they got them in television. We spend multi-billions of dollars on our health. If it's new, improved, and organic, we buy it because we want to live a good life. We, we want our life to be prosperous. We want to be respected in life. We, we want to make an impact in this life. We want, yes, we want to make money in life. And we want to be able to retire. He's going to cover all of that. My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments. First thing, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will be added to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and the sight of man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Every time I read that, I think about my path. I don't know about yours, but I think if they plotted my path in life, it would be nothing but bends and turns and crookedness. Trying to find, trying to get to a point. You know, the quickest distance to a point is a straight line. Jesus said, don't lean to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. Ah, what about arrogance and pride? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your produce. You know why the emphasis on first fruits? Because first fruits was kind of a test. Because in this culture, that crop coming in was truly a blessing from God. Because they didn't always get good rain. They didn't always have a big crop. And so that first crop that came in, that would be the thing that assured them that they could eat. But God said, wait a minute. I want you to give me that first fruit. I want you to give me that first cutting, those first grapes, that first wheat. I want you to write that first check for the work of the Lord. And what that does is that is trust that there is going to be sufficiency that will follow. That's why he's saying to you, don't trust in yourself. Self will tell you, you can't, you can't, you can't. In everything, you can't volunteer. You can't do this. You couldn't make a trip to Tanzania. You couldn't make a trip to Lithuania or Egypt. You can't go to the fields there and play with children. The first response is, I can't. But that's our understanding. 
Be not, be not wise in your own eyes. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be busting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. Pastor, I, I can't do everything. I have a family. I have bills to pay. I have a life to live. Proverbs chapter 3 will be some of the greatest guidance in your life. Because that is the prescription for the life that we all desire to live. A long life, a full life, a healthy life, a life where we're loved and where we love other people, where people respect us, where we have influence, all of the things in life that we struggle to achieve and so many times fail is wrapped up in 12 little verses that's hundreds of years old. And it comes down to this. Your first start in life is a relationship with Jesus Christ. We learned last week that it's not enough just to believe in Jesus even the devils believe and they have a response. They tremble. The response from us is this. We simply receive that salvation that Jesus Christ offers us. And in receiving that salvation, we give a life that is transitory. We give a life that is finite. We give a life that is sinful, we give a life that really doesn't count for much. But Jesus' blood paid for that life. And he doesn't just say, give me. He said, you give me your life, and I'm going to give you a life like you have never lived before. The ability without an aid to lay down and sleep at night knowing that God is watching over you, knowing that God has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that through Christ Jesus I'll provide all of your needs. Not only that, in receiving that salvation, when that dreaded time of death comes, and death is going to come to us all if God continues to delay his coming you still lay down and you close your eyes in sleep because you wake them in the presence of God for a new life, a new body that words cannot compare to the church, fellow believers. He says, the times in the world you live in is wicked. You cannot do everything for everybody. You cannot save the world of not ask you to. But everybody can impact one. Everybody can impact one. And if we simply allow the life of Christ, see, we don't have to figure out how Christ gives us this life to live. And we just simply live it out every day. It's better than all the verbal preaching in the world. It's for people who are struggling with life and want hope to see what life and hope looks like in the flesh. So my children, do not forget the teachings of the Lord. Do not forget to obey his commandments. Give that life to Christ for a life that you could never, ever 
describe that life that you live in Christ. Be an impactor of this earth. Early church did. Turn the world upside down. I think we're living in a time when this world needs to be ups- turned upside down. God has given us a community. This morning, I simply say, do you know personally Jesus Christ is your Savior? Have you ever said to him, I not only believe, but I receive. I exchange. I, I give you my life for your life. Followed him in believer's baptism. Begin to grow every day in the sense of living with, under God's eye. Are you without a church home? You've heard what kind of church this is. See, that's the most important. That's more important than anything else. If you'd like to be a part of it, we'd love to have you be a part of it. This morning, I just simply ask you, Lord, I'm part of community. Where do I go? What would I do? Because we've got a community to reach for Jesus. And I thank God for the people that he's given us here to reach those people. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the blessedness and the power of your word. Lord, these are not just words of hope and promise like the world gives. These are words that are thousands of years old. And generation after generation, those who obey your these words live in the prosperity of life this morning I just pray that these 12 verses would sink deeply into our hearts and lives let us consider do we have faith or do we have faith in works do we really believe what you have said God, today, speak into lives as you never have before. We thank you. Thank you for what you're going to do through this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.